So anyway, now can we make that a little bit bigger? Yes. Uh, we're going to look this morning, Revelation chapter 17. We looked at a couple of verses, verses 1 and 2 this morning. Um, you know, folk, what we're going to look at this morning is, um, <laughs> well, sometimes it gets folk a little bit upset. Mm -hmm. But um, we're going to look at it anyway. We need to understand what this passage is saying. Folk, as we noticed this morning in Matthew chapter 24, there would be deception at the end of time. And there is a drive in our world to make institutions look saintly and to look holy and to look godly uh, when they're not. And um, that only is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So we're going to look this morning in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Um, we noticed in our talk this morning that we have a conspiracy. It's not a theory. It's a, it's a full-blown fact because Webster's tells us that a conspiracy is two or more groups united together with a sinister purpose. That's a conspiracy. And we noticed in Revelation 17 this morning, in verses 1 and 2, that we have a conspiracy right there in those two verses because we have the great whore and we have the kings of the earth in verse 2. That's a conspiracy. So the powers of earth... And this poor woman are united together. So let's take a look at this great whore. Just about nobody or very few people in the world anymore will talk about this chapter because it has uh, serious implications and people don't want to deal with them. But we're going to. Revelation 17, verse 1 says, I will show unto thee the judgments of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Obviously, we have a symbol there, the whore. Throughout Scripture, folk, and you can go back and read these passages, throughout the Bible, a whore or an apostate woman, an impure woman in the Bible, represents an apostate church. Just what is for example, there's a book in the Bible called Hosea. And Hosea was called to marry. Does anybody know the woman he was supposed to marry? What was her name? Gomer. Gomer. That's right. And what was Gomer? A prostitute. She was a harlot or a prostitute. And Hosea was a prophet. So why did God tell Hosea to do something? I mean, that's, that's a real story, folks. Why did God tell Hosea to marry this impure woman? Why? It was to be an object lesson to show God's love for Israel, for his people who were behaving like a harlot. And so Gomer represented God's professed people at that time. So you find that in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Jeremiah 3, 6 to 8, Ezekiel 16, 15 to 30, and the whole book of Hosea, that's what it's about. So we have an apostate church. Now we're not talking, and this is very important, we're not talking about individual people in that church. That's not what we're talking about. Because, folk, there isn't a single church on the earth that isn't mixed with some people that love God and people that don't. There isn't a church on the earth that isn't like that. So this is, we're talking about the institution, we're talking about the high-ranking officials in that church that have sinister <clears throat> plans for the people of this world. Now, verse of Revelation 17 it says that the woman 
sits upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this whore riding upon this beast is committing blasphemy. Now, I want you to notice, and we're going to read these verses, because I think this is so significant. Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Let's see, number one, if we can discern from the Bible, let the Bible interpret itself, what is blasphemy? And then we'll see if we can't figure out who this apostate church is. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. The story of the man who was let down through the tiles and the roof in Capernaum. Jesus saw their faith. Verse 5 says, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus can forgive sin. <clears throat> and it doesn't qualify what they are. It doesn't say, well, it's only A and B, but not C and D. No, it says Jesus forgives sins. And the same power that Christ had to forgive sins in the first century is still here for us today. Amen. He can still forgive. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus had the power to do it back then and he still has that power to do it for us today. Great news. Great news, folks. Best news there is. We don't have to walk around with burdens wondering can God forgive me for what I've done? No. Jesus said Thy sins be forgiven thee. Mm -hmm. End of story. Close book. Close case. It's for us. It's for you. It's for me. We ask it. We ask it. So Jesus forgave the man of his sins. Well, verse 6 says, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So what did the Jews say? They said, what, what is this man doing? He's, he's speaking blasphemy. He can't forgive anybody of their sins. He's just a man. So that's what blasphemy is. It's a man claiming that he has power to forgive sin. That's blasphemy, according to the Bible. Now, can you think of a church on this earth today that's been claiming that power for the last 15 to 1700 years that a person can go into a confessional and confess their sins to a man. And the man on the other side of the curtain says, I forgive you. Now can you think of a religious institution on this planet that claims that power? Can you? The Roman Catholic Church. So if we didn't look at any other characteristic in Revelation 17, we now know exactly who is the sinister church at the end of time. Because they claim that power. Now the other 
third way that a person commits blasphemy? John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Notice. John chapter 10, verse 30 through 33. That's the beauty of studying the Bible. The Bible will interpret itself. It was so clear what blasphemy was. Now notice this next one. Listen to the story. It's real simple. Verse, 10, uh, verse 30 of John chapter 10. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The Jews took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. So now they're accusing Jesus of blasphemy again. What did they say? Because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Can you think of a religious institution on this earth today who claims they can forgive sins and claims the titles of God? Is there, are there any religious leaders in the world that claim to be the Holy Father? Or when we address them, people say, Thank you, Father. Bless the Father. Can you think of any? It's the Catholic Church system again. Again, are we attacking an individual? Of course not. There are so many beautiful Roman Catholics across this world. But God wants them to understand the truth of his word. I remember years ago driving through Atlanta with my family on the way to Tennessee. As we came on the outskirts of Atlanta on I-75 going north, there was this huge billboard over on the left side and it said, the Holy Father knows best. And right next to it, there was a picture of John Paul II. And I thought, wait a minute. He's, he's the Holy Father? Well, from what I've read about John Paul II, he was, he was a drug addict. He sold cyanide poisoning to the Third Reich during World War II. He's the Holy Father? The man was involved in the international drug trade for two decades with the CIA filtering drug money through the Vatican Bank. He's the holy, that's not a holy father. That's not somebody I'm going to bow down myself to. That man was as corrupt as they came. But they claim the prerogatives that belong to Jesus Christ alone. Would any of them die? For any of us? But Jesus did. Jesus died because he loved each one of us. And he calls us to his side. He calls us to follow him. And that's our privilege today. To not be held by any man but to be able to follow one who could love us so much that he died. He died. Because we're that important to him. Another characteristic of the great whore of Revelation 17 is he's super rich. The whore's name is Babylon. The whore is a persecutor of people. Revelation 17, verse 6. The whore's geographical location is an area of seven hills. The whore rises in the old world where nations and peoples have always been. And the whore or apostate church is also the name of a famous city in the world. 
Now, there's a lot of confusion in our world today over who this antichrist or this apostate church might be. You know, some people will say, well, I think it's, uh, I think it's Islam, or I think it's the Masons, or I think it's the Jews, or it's the CFR, or it's communism, or the Bilderbergers. Is it possible, friend, why there's so much confusion is because this apostate church doesn't want the finger pointed at them. Is that possible? That they're conjuring up all these other enemies to say, no, the real enemy is over there. Remember what we read about this morning about deception? Remember Jesus said, watch out. Don't let anybody deceive you. And deception is saying, here, here's the problem. It's right over here. Be careful. Everything's going on here. When in actuality, it's all going on over there. So is it possible that all these thousands of voices through the world are pointing us all in the wrong direction? Is that possible? Papacy can be the only fulfillment of the great horror of Revelation chapter 17. You know, I had a I had a lady write to me from New York City who had gotten one of my books called The Secret Terrorist. She wasn't very happy with it. <laughs> she wrote me a postcard. She said, you are a blasphemer. How dare you criticize the one true holy Roman and apostolic church you heretic will burn in hell for all eternity. <laughs> Only the most holy, supreme, sovereign, pontiff, holy pope. Has the power of transubstantiation, not heretics like you. So why haven't I learned my lesson? Because friend, what I just shared with you, I didn't pull that off the top of my head. I think it's back of the bookstore. That's a picture of some saint. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who it is, Lois. I had another lady in Coos Bay, Oregon that came up to me after a meeting and her face was as red as a red delicious apple. <laughs> <laughs> and she had her buddies on either side of her. And she got within about, what's that, about six inches? About six inches of my face. And uh, she said, don't you ever talk about my church like that again. And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I said, what I shared today was not something I conjured up. I said, I only opened the Bible and the Bible spoke to you. And I said, ma'am, as long as I have blood it flows through my veins. By God's grace, I will declare those truths. You know, folk, I've had so many Roman Catholic people from around the world, predominantly in Africa, 
who have followed, instead of following their leader, instead of following their priest or their pope, they have actually gone to the Bible and let the Bible speak to their own heart. And they, they ended up rejoicing. They said, we have learned the truth. Amen. And the truth, the truth has set me free. It set me free to be a man, to be a woman. No longer to be under the control of any man. This is the truth of scripture, friends. And... Uh, you know, there was a famous English reformer by the name of John Wycliffe in the 13th century. And he got ill and was on his deathbed, it, it appeared. And some friars came to his bedside and they said, they said, confess your wrongs, confess your apostasy against the church. And John Wycliffe said, lift me up. And he said, do you think that you are fighting against an old man on the brink of the grave. He said, you're not fighting with me. He said, you're fighting with truth. Truth that is stronger than you and will overcome you. Folk, deal with, deal with the truth of Scripture. Let the Bible teach you as the Bible has shown us about blasphemy, the Bible has spoken. Not me. The Bible has spoken. We've simply reasoned what we have seen. So the Bible tells us the kings of the earth do her bidding. Revelation 17, 2, it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Well, friends, I think... It's pretty clear what fornication is. That's when two people are together that shouldn't be together. And so the kings of the earth, the political black powers of earth, are committing fornication with Babylon the Great, with this apostate church. That's what the Bible's teaching. And, but the Bible goes further than to say they're in unlawful union because that gives you the idea that they're equals. But Revelation 17, 18, notice what it says. It says, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Who's calling the shots? Is the great whore calling the shots? Or are the kings of the earth calling the shots? I want you to think about that, friend. Think. Think for a minute. Who, who is, who is ruling the world today? Think, friends. The Bible says the woman, the apostate church, Romanism, is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Who's in charge? Churches, not the kings of the earth. You say, I thought Joe Biden was the greatest political leader on the face of this earth. I thought he was calling the shots. What's that one? He can't remember things. Well, that's right. But, folks, if the political powers of earth are controlled by the Vatican. The Vatican is telling them what to do. Joe Biden, king of the earth. Notice what priest Phelan said over 100 years ago in the Western Watchman, June 27, 1912. Now this is a Roman Catholic priest who said this, if the government of the United States were at war with the church, we would say tomorrow, to hell with the government of the United States. 
Excuse me. And if the church and all the governments of the world were at war, we would say to hell with all the governments of the world. Why is it the Pope has such tremendous power? The Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. Do you know what an altar boy says when a priest says, I want you to jump? Do you know what an altar boy says? John, what does he say? Do you know? <laughs> an altar boy says, how high? How high? And according to this Catholic priest, over a hundred years ago, what do you think it's like today? Is Donald Trump a king of the earth? Yes, he was. No, he might have been. Is, is he a political leader in this world? Is he? Yes, he was. Yes. He was, and he could be again. Might be again. Yeah. Okay. Kamala Harris, is she a political leader in this world today? Yes. Are they? Yes. Okay. She's trying. <laughs> the point being, friends, these are political leaders. And according to the Bible, they are doing the bidding of the Roman papacy. That's the point. And it doesn't matter if they go by the label of Republican, and it doesn't matter if they go by the name of Democrat. It doesn't make any difference because the Bible does not differentiate, does it? It doesn't say with whom the Republicans are committing fornication. It doesn't say that, does it? Nor does it say Democrats. So what is the point? The point is, friend, as you look two months down the road, it doesn't make a bit of difference if you choose to vote or not. It doesn't make any difference. Why? Because the Bible says the kings of the earth are committing fornication with the papacy. It doesn't matter who gets in. Who's going to be controlling them? The papacy is. You know the story about Canossa and King John III? Henry IV was in Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor. King John III was in England. They both dared, they dared to exercise their God-ordained role as the leaders of their country during the Dark Ages. John in the 13th century, uh, Henry in, I believe it was the 13th century as well, Henry had to stay outside of the castle of Gregory VII for three days before the Pope Gregory would see him. That was in 1077. He waited in the snow for three days. This take, took place at the castle of Canossa. There he is again at Canossa, the divine right of kings. Are you familiar with that? The divine right of kings says that whoever becomes the leader of a country, they do exactly as their divine leader tells them to do. There was one lady in the country of England 
who decided that she was actually going to be the monarch of England in the 16th century. Do you remember what her name was? She was Henry VIII's daughter. What was her name? Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. That's right. And Queen Elizabeth started to rule in 1558 when her half-sister Mary died. And so for the next, from 1558 till she died in 1603, friends, history tells us there were at least a dozen attempts on her life. Why? Because she refused to surrender her crown to the papacy. So what happened was, in the 1580s, Pope Sixtus got together with Philip II of Spain and he said, look, Philip, I will give you probably the equivalent today of, of probably $50 billion. I'll give you a, an exorbitant sum of money, but you've got to do one thing for me. You've got to get your fleet of ships, which we call today as the Spanish Armada, and you've got to sail them right up the western side of, of Europe. And I want you to go up there. And I want you to take Queen Elizabeth captive. And I want you to take over England from me. Philip did that, didn't he? <laughs> Sent the Spanish Armada right up. Friends, that was a crusade against Queen Elizabeth. That's what it was. It was a crusade. Why? Because Elizabeth would not relinquish England to the Pope. Many attempts made on her life, all else failed, we send in the Spanish Armada. 1588, this is from uh, Shepard's book, The Babington Plot. He says, because Elizabeth I rejected the papacy's authority to control her and her kingdom, the papacy sought to slay her many times. When these failed, they encouraged Philip II of Spain to build the Armada and destroy Elizabeth that way. Later on, it was Pope Sixtus who promised Philip of Spain a million scudi to assist in equipping his invincible Armada to destroy the throne of Elizabeth. And the only condition the Pope made in bestowment of his gift, he should have the nomination of the English sovereign, that the kingdom should become a fife of the church. Now maybe somebody is saying, well, that happened in the 1600s. I live in the, you know, I live in the 20, 2000s. That doesn't happen today. We're, we're way too advanced in culture for something like that to happen. Well, friends, about a month ago, I visited a place. I flew into Dallas, Texas to have some <coughs> meetings there, and I asked the people to take me to Ely Plaza. And Ely Plaza was where John F. Kennedy was shot, November 22, 1963. And we've all heard the stories about the terrible madman, Lee Harvey Oswald. The lone gunman that shot John F. Kennedy. And folks, that is just, just a whole bunch of lies. A whole bunch of lies. If you've seen the Zabruder film, you've seen John F. Kennedy's head go forward with his upper body, he goes forward. And then all of a sudden, his body jerks back. He clearly, clearly was struck from the back and the front. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so miserable. The lies that have been perpetrated. You say, well, why was John F. Kennedy shot? Well, friends, John F. Kennedy opposed the papacy. He promised the pastors of Texas before his election. He said, if I am elected, I will be the president for all Americans. And I will maintain the separation of the church and state. 
John F. Kennedy promised, he said, I'm going to return America to the gold standard where we're actually going to print our own money. And John F. Kennedy said that he was going to destroy the CIA for what they did at the Bay of Pigs. And folks, the CIA and the Federal Reserve System, if you study it out, both of those are intricately connected to the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church. The evidence is overwhelming. So John F. Kennedy had to go. He opposed the inroads of the Vatican, just like Queen Elizabeth had done. Same way. Same way. So here's some of our kings of the earth, the Obamas, Putin, Kamala Harris, not them, Kim Jong-un, Benjamin Netanyahu. They're kings of the earth, friends. They are kings of the earth. And the Bible says they're under Rome's control. What the Bible says. Friends, do your research. Do your research on the current people that are running for the presidency. Find out how connected they are to the Vatican. The evidence is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Donald Trump trained at, at uh, Fordham University for two years sent his children, several of them, to Georgetown <clears throat> University, a Jesuit institution. His three electives to the Supreme Court, all educated by the Vatican in Jesuit schools. All of them, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Barrett. That's Donald Trump, friends. He is a servant of the great whore. Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are two peas in a pod. <laughs> Joe Biden is a devout Catholic. Kamala Harris is a, a multi-religious, has a multi-religious background. But Kamala Harris, friends, is right in line with Biden's agenda, and Biden is a devout Catholic. <clears throat> Biden and Harris are both completely behind Pope Francis's climate change agenda. Both of them. So whether you go Trump or Harris, you're really choosing Rome no matter how you vote. My advice to you, don't. Don't vote. But who's gonna win? Lois? That's fine. The person will win whom Rome has determined and decreed will be the victor. That's who will win. Who else is involved in this international conspiracy according to Revelation 17? We have the papacy, we have the kings of the earth, but we also have the merchants. And who are the merchants of the earth? Yes. Financial institutions. Financial institutions. Joan? Cheryl. 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 Thank you, Cheryl. Big, wealthy corporations. Who did you say? Uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. You know, <laughs> folk, the Bible, the Bible is giving us clues it's like a mystery puzzle. That's what it is. And so we've got to put the pieces together. That's what the Bible's telling us. The merchants of the earth. Notice what the Bible says to give you further evidence. It says, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Her is the great whore, Babylon the great. For no man buys their merchandise anymore. So the merchants sell things. They buy and sell things. Well, who does that? Bill Gates. Big business. Morgans. Chase. Rockefellers. 
the merchandise of gold and silver, stones, pearls, linen, purple, scarlet, silk, all thine wood, all manner of vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood, brass, iron, marble, cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, beef, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and souls of men. So that's what these people buy and sell. You know, I find some of these really, really fascinating. Slaves, souls of men, and all these commodities. People have become a commodity. You know what um, Albert Pike and others have called folk like you and me? We're called goyim. That's what, that's what they look upon us as. And what are goyim? That's human cattle. All we do is follow the cow right in front of us. We don't think. We don't analyze. We don't decipher things. We don't reason. We simply follow what we're told. That's what a cow does. That's what a cow does. And those cows are, are headed straight to slaughter. And that's what Rome wants for every one of us. And that's what they're trying to do, friends, today. And God, God is calling us to say, I'm going to accept only what I can see in the Bible. I am not going to accept the lies of media. I am not going to accept the status quo. I am only going to accept the principles and the truths of Scripture. Because, friend, that is the only way that you and I can be men and women of God. That's why Jesus died, was to make us that kind of people. But look at these people. The slave trade. You know, last weekend I was in North Carolina holding meetings. And, you know, as, as I read... I was reading one slide and it said, from the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. And I'm going, I, I had to stop my meeting. I said, what a bunch of hypocrites that wrote the Declaration of Independence. They didn't say, they, they wrote in there, all men are created equal while half of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had slaves on their plantation. <laughs> what is that? That's hypocrisy, friend. Did God inspire that even without their knowledge? Probably, Lois. <laughs> Probably. Uh, it's, it's a shame. It's, it's, it's a crying shame what humanity, what we are capable of doing apart from the grace of God. The hypocrisy. Uh, you know, they, they looked upon the slaves as three-fifths of a man. What? Three-fifths of a... No. They're either five-fifths or they're, they're, they cease to exist. But folk, if you study history, if you study history, it was Babylon the Great, the papal power, along with these merchants that created the slave trade. They created it, friends. The Pope back in the 1490s, he said, I'm going to cut the world in half and everything to the northern hemisphere goes to Spain and everything to the southern hemisphere goes to Portugal. Well, they were, both those countries were rapidly involved in the slave trade. Mm -hmm. Rapidly involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so was the Pope back then. So Bill Gates, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Chases, they're connected to Babylon the Great. Oh my. What's this guy's name over here? 
Come on, this guy right here. You got a store within a probably 10 or 15 minutes of, of where we're meeting. Come on, what's his name? Walton. Say it again. Sam Walton. Darlene. Walton. Sam Walton. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sam Walton. Who's this guy? <coughs> Ted Turner. Are they merchants of the earth? They're merchants of the earth, friend. Who are they working for? They're working for Rome. That's right. What is your name there? Kathy. Kathy. Thank you. They're working for Rome, friends. Does that look familiar with them? Is that the founder of Walmart and the Fox News person? Yes. CNN. CNN. He's the one who started Walmart. Okay. This man was the one who started CNN and then branched out into mega businesses. And of course, Sam Walton started at a a little five and dime store in Bentonville, Arkansas, in the northwest corner of Arkansas, in a little podunk town. You know, it's the kind, my, my aunt lived there, and I visited there as a young person. Bentonville, Arkansas was the kind of town where if you, if you go through and you blink, you're gonna miss it. That's where Sam, and so you look and you say, how did Sam Walton, this is a rag to riches story. I mean, what a, what a businessman he was. That's not true, friend. Sam Walton took his business public. He started selling stock in it. And a drug dealer in Arkansas by the name of Jackson Stevens said, if, if you play my game, we'll take you all over the world. So Sam Walton said, I'd love to play that game. And that's why Walmart is a, is a quadruple billion dollar business all over the world today. Because Sam Walton sold his soul. Sold his soul to Rome. It goes on and on. The world's wealthy remain rich as they are willing to sell their souls to Rome and the Jesuits. Revelation 18, 15 is clear. The papacy rules the rich. The international bankers go as the papacy bids her. And there's our buddy, our jabbing buddy up there in, uh, outside of Seattle. Did he ever take the vaccine he said? I would okay. imagine he didn't. That's what I Yeah, they're real good at that, you know. They tell everybody else to, but they know the garbage that's in it, they wouldn't touch it. Yeah. Political leaders, the rich, is there more? Yeah. Do we have a conspiracy? Yes. And we do, don't we? Two or more groups. We've already seen three. That's a conspiracy, friends. So you know what? We can have a million. No, we can have a billion PhDs. And we can have another three billion scientists or historians or philosophers. And they can all stand up and they can say, Oh, that conspiracy? Those people are just, you know, they just got a few screws missed upstairs. <laughs> Folk, you know, it doesn't matter how many billions of people poo-poo conspiracy. The Bible says there is. And the story is over. It's over, friend. Because the Bible says there is a conspiracy. So who else is a part of the conspiracy? Well, Revelation 17, 5 says, on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. So that's the apostate whore. The mother of whom? Harlots. Well, if the mother is an impure woman committing fornication, and that's an apostate church, then what do the daughters, the harlot daughters of the mother church, what would they represent? They also are impure women. What would they represent? Think about it. What would they represent? Speaking of other Sunday following churches. Speaking of other churches, that are following right in the path of the, 
of the mother church. So these would be churches that have embraced the same ideas and are following the same principles as the papacy. Now can you think of any churches that once broke away and protested the tyranny of Rome but now are following right in her footsteps? Well, friends, you've got Methodism, they're no longer protesting. You've got uh, Presbyterianism, you have uh, Baptists, you have Orthodox, you have all these churches. Now that last picture, I don't know if some of you know what that is, but that's Silver Springs, Maryland. You say, I liked it till you got to that slide. Because I like pointing fingers at all the other churches. But don't you dare point a finger at my church. Well, friends, let me, you know, I was always under the impression that when I go out to dig, I can either call that a shovel or I can call that a spade. Isn't that right, Arnold? So I think we can still call a spade a spade. Is that fair? Yes. You know, it's so easy to point fingers and say, well, the great whore is the papacy, and the harlot daughters are all the apostate Protestant churches that are no longer protesting. But Seventh-day Adventism? Oh, no, they're still pristine. That's not true, friends. As we noticed in the last meeting, it was the Seventh-day Adventist leaders that got $75 million from the government during COVID. And through that money, the denomination did exactly as they were told. Because he who pays the piper calls the tune. So who did Adventism listen to in one of the greatest crises this world has ever seen in the last 10 years. Who did Adventism listen to, friends? Be it. Tell, tell me your name again. Kathy. Kathy. Who did we listen to, Kathy? The Pope. We listened to the Pope. The Pope. That's who we listen to, folks. Now the next question is, when, when are we going to call those <coughs> leaders in Seventh-day Adventism to account? When are, you gonna, when are we going to do that, friends? I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I tried. You're canceled. I tried. And they kicked me out 30 years ago. And now I'm just the devil, you know, with a pitchfork. <laughs> Somebody has got to call them to accounting. And you know the only way you can do that? If you're still in the denomination, the only way you can do that, friends, right here because that is the only voice mm -hmm. that is the only voice they'll listen to they won't listen to truth anymore they won't listen if you pull out the, the spirit of prophecy books and you say but right here it says this and you're doing this and we're supposed to be doing that and you're doing that they won't hear a word you say but you've got to use this Pastor Hughes? Darling. Yes, Conrad Vine, he just did that. And there's mm -hmm. a big backlash against him now for calling the church out. Mm -hmm. Darlene, that, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Yeah. Um, and he got, what? he got erased from a meeting mm -hmm. with, with Stephen Bohr yeah. up here Stephen in Yosemite. Yeah. The same papal principle is rampant in Seventh-day Adventism today, mm -hmm. It's rampant. And as I've told Seventh-day Adventists all over the world, 
if you look your conference president in the eye and you say, you know what? Until, until you start doing what is right and until you start telling the truth, I'm not putting another dime in your till. That's the only way, darling, there will be a revival among Seventh-day Adventists. Because, Darlene, if it doesn't happen, the next crisis that will come to God's professed people in Seventh-day Adventism will be a Sunday law. And if the brethren are not called to accounting today, when a Sunday law comes, they will embrace that and will urge all Adventists to keep Sunday too. And Ellen White said that. So that's very true. Um, could you illustrate more in the afternoon during the Q&A? Absolutely. We have two, 10 minutes to, to hear right now. Okay. So Good deal. Good deal. We'll pick that up this afternoon. Yes. Folk, an ex-Jesuit priest by the name of Alberto Rivera, he said that by 1980, all churches, all churches, had been infiltrated and taken over by the papacy. And the sign, Alberto Rivera, an ex-Jesuit priest, he said this, he said, the sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20, 1981. Oh, do you realize that is saying for two generations, every church the voice of Protestantism is gone. It's gone. And the principles of Rome are in the forefront. In every church, friend, and I'm not talking just about, you know, Sunday keeping apostate Protestant churches. I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church since 1981. The voice of protest not there. You know, no, I'm not going to. You can ask me to pick it up later. The one big difference, friend, is in all the other churches that have been infiltrated by the papacy, the call from heaven, God says, come out of her, my people. Follow the truth. Follow what the Bible teaches. The call to Seventh-day Adventists because they have been the depositors of the truth of heaven for this time. The call to Seventh-day Adventists, it's different. It's repent. It's come back to the great truths that made us the people we are. That's the difference, friend. The messages of heaven are still in Seventh-day Adventism today. Just don't hear them. Just don't hear it. All right, one more piece of the puzzle. Revelation 18, 24, the Bible says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So Babylon the Great is charged with the blood of those who speak for God, the prophets, those who live for God, the saints. But then it goes one step further and it says of all that were slain upon the earth. And friend, that's not talking about when somebody dies because they're going 90 miles an hour in a 35. That's not what it's talking about. And it's not talking about if somebody, you know, is, is 600 pounds and they die of a heart, heart attack. That's not Rome's responsibility, that's ours. But what this is talking about of all that were slain upon the earth, where there are systematic things put in place where millions of people die, that's Rome's responsibility. War, terror attacks, 
pandemics lie at the feet of Babylon the Great. If you study history, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln in the book 50 Years in the Church of Rome by a, a former Catholic priest, Charles Chiniqui, fantastic book. Lincoln told Chiniqui, this civil war seems to be nothing but a political affair. To those who do not see as I do the secret springs of that terrible drama, but it is more religious than a civil war. It is Rome who wants to rule and degrade the North as she has ruled and degraded the South from the very day of its discovery. There are only very few of the Southern leaders who are not more or less under the influence of the Jesuits through their wives, family relations, and their friends. Several members of the family of Jeff Davis belong to the Church of Rome. Abraham Lincoln said that, friends. It was a religious war. Gettysburg, Chancellorsville, a religious war. World War I, Verdun, 700,000 men perish. Terrible battle at the hands of Babylon the Great. In the book by Edmund Perry, The Vatican Against Europe, he says Pope Pius X and his hatred of the Orthodox Christians was continually exciting Emperor Francis Joseph of Austria-Hungary to chastise the Serbians. There in true colors is the Vicar of Christ, the gentle apostle of peace, the holy pontiff, whom pious authors represent as having died of sorrow at seeing the outbreak of war. So that's what our history books will tell us, that the Pope was saddened to see World War occur, but actually he was the one behind it. We can go on and on, World War II, all the major leaders of Europe, be it Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, they were all puppets in the hands of the papacy. Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, all of that, all that were slain upon the earth, Vietnam, Avril Manhattan's book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? He makes it very clear, very clear. And who are all these powers warring against? Who are they warring against? You have the papacy. You have the political leaders of the earth. You have the merchants of the earth. You have the churches of the earth. Who are they fighting against? God Christ. They're fighting against Jesus himself. They're fighting against Christ. The Bible says in Revelation 17, 14, these shall make war with the Lamb. They're fighting Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So they're all warring with Christ, but the Bible says the Lamb shall overcome them. Where do we fit in? Well, Jesus is calling you, and he's calling me today. To listen to his call, to listen to his voice, to be faithful, to submit to him. And that's where we want to stand. We don't want to be a goyim. We don't want to be a cattle that just do what leaders tell us because it makes them feel good. But we want to sit at the feet of Christ and follow him. Follow him. You know, friends, before we close, I just have one other thing to share, and that is all of these powers are arrayed against Christ and against his truth. But God's going to win. God is going to win, friends. Revelation 18 and verse 1 tells us that probably the second greatest event in the history of this planet is just before us. Amen. Just before us, friend. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says, after these things, 
after this worldwide conspiracy has been set up and is ravishing the earth and taking liberty from the earth, the Bible says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. You know, the kind of power that we're talking about here, we're talking about the power Ten times that of a tidal wave. Ten times the power of a tidal wave. So the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, is going to come down upon his feeble children, and the earth will know there's a God in heaven. And the earth will know that truth is more precious than everything else. And friend, it's my prayer for each one of us, for each one of us to be there and to be the recipient of that power and to be God's representatives on this earth. Amen. That's my prayer for each one of us. For those who are able, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful. We're grateful for your truth. We're grateful for that that truth can set us free to be men and women of purpose, men and women of conviction, men and women of principle. We're thankful for your truth today, and we're thankful that we don't have to be brilliant person, but we can humbly submit to your authority and what you have said. And thank you that there is more power in your word than in anything in this universe. So I just pray, Father, that each one of us would determine and choose each and every day to spend time getting to know you and learn to trust you with everything they have. Bless each one of us to that end so that we can all stand on the sea of glass together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.